something that I'm working on uh, presently or for the lead in the context of the Google Summer of Code project and later. So let's start with a bit introduction about timers and why you should care. So basically many of the computerized activities that you generally run on are uh, driven by timers. Most of the time, uh, even if their this is not visible to the user. For example, uh, in the case of a TCP transmission, if a packet gets lost, basically there is a timer that keeps track of uh, how much time has been elapsed since the send, and if the threshold is uh, um, reached, a retransmission procedure is activated. The same works, for example, for uh, shutdown of the screen uh, in case there is no interaction uh, of the user with devices such as, for example, keyboards or mouse. Uh, in general, kernel drivers, a system called dealing with time, as you will see in the next of the talk, need a mechanism to hold function in the future at a later time. Another example that came up to my mind, for example, is uh, um, the UMA allocator, which is the kernel allocator. Basically, you need to dump statistics on a given time, and in order to get this, you basically uh, need some timer that uh, periodically takes your statistics and dump it somewhere to make it uh, readable to understand, for example, how much allocation have you done uh, from a given size. Uh, so, in FreeBSD, and mostly in general in all the BSD flavors, uh, the programming interface that uh, allow the kernel developer uh, to schedule a function that uh, will be called at a later time is called out. So, Basically, this future time at which the function will be called, it's expressed using a relative value which is tix. So tix basically is a, an internal value which is represented using a 32 bit integer and granularity changes depending on some system parameters as we will see in future. Just to give you an, an overview. You have uh, some function that allows uh, to uh, initialize a timeout and this is done allocating a structure. This is done in the kernel uh, consumer rather than uh, in uh, the subsystem that uh, deals with the uh, timer internal itself. So basically, consumer allocates their callout rather than doing this inside callout itself because uh, it's easier for consumers, uh, it's easier for the system because they don't need to deal with lifetime. So it allocates and allocates the callout explicitly. If you want to schedule a timeout, you specify the callout you allocated previously, the function and the argument, and obviously how much in the future you want to call. So basically, if for some reason uh, it happens that you want to stop your callout because, for example, the driver um, has been stopped or uh, the link uh, of the Ethernet card broken, you call this function that is callout stop. After a bit introduction on uh, how this uh, API works, I would like to go about all the consumers within kernel and user space more or less directly of callout. So basically there are lots of functions, for example, uh, condition variables that uh, are a mechanism that is used in conjunction, in conjunction with locking primitive to, um, under, to see if a condition holds and maybe do some things. Or uh, in, within the sleep queue mechanism, which is uh, basically a mechanism within the kernel that allows you to uh, put uh, a thread sleeping for a given amount of time. And uh, these functions basically uh, can uh, wait or can put sleeping the thread for a limited amount of time. 
And this amount of time is expressed using the demo variable. And uh, this value is passed directly to Bala. Actually, also, most of the system call uh, posits uh, uh, available in FreeBSD that rely with timer, uh, that uh, deal with timer rely at a lower level or call-out. For example, one of the examples that came to my mind is a uh, sleep that uh, takes a new servant thread and makes it sleeping for uh, the um, parameter specified uh, in terms of uh, uh, microseconds. Uh, uh, when it calls the kernel at some point after a chain of call, it relies on color. Uh, assistant call, the system call that uh, usually does the multi, multiplex uh, synchronous and all, which is select, can wait for uh, the file descriptor for a given amount of time. And this is specified using uh, uh, this last of, uh, argument, which is timeout. So, as you see in the bug, as you see uh, before, the both um, callout and uh, the consumer in the kernel basically rely uh, on uh, they pass their timeout using the uh, 32 bit types. So, uh, otherwise, uh, at least on AMD64, userland API rely on uh, 64 bit type, and uh, this is variable, it depends on the architecture, but it's uh, 64 to uh, 128 bytes. So, in some way, passing from userland to kernel, you shrink this value and uh, lose the precision. I'll do it. So, this is a general picture. These are the services in userland that rely, obviously, at a lower level in the kernel on some ABI, KBI, but uh, at a lower level, everything goes to the sink, which is called out, which is the general KPI that allows you to schedule the function. So, uh, I want to do, I, as I expressed it before, the timeout which is palestated to the out is uh, expressed in terms of ticks. What is, which is ticks? So basically ticks is a global kernel variable that keeps track of how much time has elapsed since boots. Uh, Historically, there were available only periodic timers. So basically, you set a frequency, you decide uh, how, uh, which is the frequency at which the timer should fire. For example, uh, 1,000 times per second, uh, 10,000 times per second. And uh, at that frequency, the timer generates interrupts. So on every interrupt, it happens that this function called a clock is called and the value of x is updated by one unit accordingly. So basically this is a way, even if it's not fine-grained, to um, keep track of how much time has been elapsed since books. So in the last years, lots of vendors, for example Intel, produced some uh, uh, hardware timers that allow you to um, uh, reprogram explicitly. So rather than fixing one frequency and having the timer uh, uh, firing at that frequency, you can explicitly within software in the kernel reprogram the timer for the next interrupt. This is surely nice because it generates, it gener it generates less uh, interrupts. But uh, as you can see, the cloud measure is more reliable from the old method on the old timers. So, in most of the systems, at least on bare metal hardware, each that is equal to 1,000, which means that the timer fires 1,000 times per second, which means uh, uh, you have uh, one millisecond interval of resolutions. So, if you pass this Time, they call out the uh, timeout value in terms of tick to the kernel. Everything is rounded to the next tick. So basically, 
the problem is that for user-based consumers, that uh, allows to specify the um, precision uh, very accurately, for example, in terms of uh, microsecond or even nanosecond. When they go to the kernel, this value is automatically rounded to one millisecond precision. And um, obviously, this is not something uh, we really want because uh, um, you lose granularity for, for system call like uh, uh, nano sleep, uh, you sleep, and also for real time application within the kernel, you might want better granularity. So, this is just an overview of how uh, callout is implemented within the kernel. There is another structure that um, keeps track of the outstanding timer within the system. It's basically a table, an array of, uh, of lists, of unsorted lists. So when uh, someone calls callout, uh, initializing the callout and setting the timeout, it basically takes the actual value of a tick adds the relative value passed to the as argument to allow it, apply one hash function in order to find the right bucket where the uh, timeout uh, needs to be inserted and inserts there. So, uh, basically, when uh, otherwise uh, hard block is called and tick is incremented by one uh, uh, unit, also, uh, uh, the packet currently pointed by the quantity uh, tick uh, module n is uh, called, and that packet is processed to see if there are events that are fired. If they are fired, they are, the callback function is called. Uh, in order to call the callback function, you basically don't do directly that in the hardware interrupt context. You schedule a software interrupt thread and then allow it is executed there. Because this is happened because uh, basically from hardware interrupt context, uh, you can't call, uh, uh, you can't uh, hold locks, uh, at least sleeping locks, uh, otherwise you risk to introduce deadlocks and other <coughs> problems. So basically this is uh, a way to overcome this limitation. Some recent changes that has been done. Basically, the data structure that we have seen has been replaced with uh, uh, per CPU data structure. <coughs> this is a way to, in some sense, uh, reduce lock contention and uh, improve scalability of the whole uh, mechanism. Because rather than having all the thread um, contesting a single lock, they contest the per CPU lock. And the API has been extended, allowing to specify on which CPU uh, the callout wants to be run as an argument. So, this is the current design before we did some changes. And it has some good point because uh, there are no hardware assumptions. It works also with uh, uh, periodic timers and it doesn't need uh, a complex infrastructure. Also, the time is called as a current uh, global variable and uh, reading it is uh, relatively cheap. Obviously, the drawbacks uh, is, are, are many. As I explained before, there is the lack of precision because you cannot tell the more than one millisecond granularity. Other problem is that uh, even if uh, the bucket of the wheel uh, is uh, completely empty, I mean, if there are no events to schedule, the CPU is woken up everything. So basically, waking up the CPU from a deep sleep, state sleep may be um, um, may be a uh, complex operation, an uh, uh, energy consumption operation, energy consumptive operation. And this is particularly important, for example, in the topic of uh, laptops. So, there is no way to allow callouts to be uh, coalesced or deferred. So, one customer, rather than 
wanting I granular ID might say I want this function to be loaded after two seconds. But everything before three seconds is fine for me. This is no way. You can specify just one value. And as I explained before, all that allows running in a software interrupt networks. So uh, we proposed general, uh, recently a new design that tried to overcome these issues. And um, this is uh, this has been recently merged to FreeBSD current branch. And the rationale between these, uh, behind these uh, choices is uh, try to improve the accuracy of events, trying to remove the concept of peer. Basically, the, as you see, the cloud design rely on the concept of peer. And uh, avoid the periodic CPU wake-ups because you don't want to CPU wake-up uh, if in case there is no work to do. Try to allow a way to group uh, events that are close in time in order to reduce the number of interrupts. Try also to maintain uh, compatibility with the existing uh, programming interface. This is uh, a fact that is particularly important because uh, basically all the, uh, there are lots of vendors that uh, write drivers that rely on this uh, programming interface. If you break the programming interface they are using, you break also the code they are running. So basically they modify or need to define a uh, particular, uh, they need to if def their code in order to run between uh, different PSP versions. And also don't introduce performance penalties. So, as I explained, the user and services provide a fair enough level of precision. Microseconds. And uh, in any case, they cannot be touched at all because they are standardized by POSIX. And in case you change system call that rely with Tiger, you automatically lose the uh, uh, POSIX compliance. On the other hand, all the kernel APIs built around the concept of periodic and of T. So, theory to bit type is uh, too less to represent microsecond granularity without weekly overflow. And there is the need to switch to another data type that is more capable to represent the, this uh, precision. Actually, uh, there are three types in FreeBSD that allow to express time. Uh, time spec, time val, and this time. The first two are not really suitable because they uh, represent a decimal number rather than binary number. So the arithmetic on them uh, is uh, particularly difficult. The last type is interesting because it's a binary number, so you can do arithmetic in terms of uh, uh, shift uh, and uh, uh, simple um, uh, operations. But uh, it's uh, too big. It's 128 bits. And they are too much. Because right now, hardware clocks uh, have uh, short term uh, capabilities, have short term stabilities uh, that approaches uh, uh, 1 over 100 uh, microseconds. But in general, they don't have uh, granularity which is more than 1 microsecond. Also, um, it makes uh, the job of uh, compiler a bit more difficult because uh, C type doesn't provide uh, in the 128 type and uh, you need to express it using a struct and uh, I mean it's a more complex operation. So in order to overcome this issue it, it's been introduced a new type in order to deal with time with allowed. You can think it as a shrinked bin type. Rather than using 64 bit and 64 bit for the integer part and the fractional part, you use 32 bit for the integer part and 32 bit for the fractional part. Considering that the box stabilities are not uh, in general more than one microsecond, you are okay because 32 bit for the fractional part allows you to specify uh, one quarter microsecond granularity. 
It fits in an integer 6040 uh, type, which is readily available in the C language. And uh, the expressing uh, real world quantities for making a mathematical comparison is relatively easy. You need just to compare as you compare true integer. And uh, you can easily express these macros that gives you one second, one minute, one millisecond. So, the KPI has been proposed and has been extended, introducing some other function for the developers. Uh, basically, uh, the old function has been maintained in order to keep compatibility with older versions. And this new function has been introduced and they are generally the same as before, but they change for these three arguments. Basically, rather than specifying using 32 bit tick value for, uh, for uh, timeout, you use ST in time t, which is 64 bit value and gives you higher granularity. You also, I, I, we also added another argument that allows to specify precision because this was not available before. <coughs> And also another uh, argument called flag has been introduced because uh, it could be useful in future to uh, specify uh, particular behavior for some call out uh, and uh, this is the only way to pass it. So also for all the KPI, a new function has been introduced that uh, is called out reset flag. It's basically the same API as before, but it allows you to specify this uh, additional argument uh, for the flex that specify the particular behavior of the callout running on. So, the changes to the backend, so, so the wheel, uh, the data structure we've seen before, are the following. The wheel has become tickless. So, basically, if you want shock timer is available, rather than waking up the CPU every time they interrupt the fires, you just uh, uh, scan back it in the future to see when there is the next event and reprogram interrupt for the next event. This greatly re um, reduces the number of interrupt on most of the systems. In particular, if the CPU is idle. Because if the CPU is idle, a, set, uh, a threshold is set and CPU is woken up uh, two times per second, every one, one half second. So basically this is nice because uh, uh, it reduces the number of interrupt from uh, one, at least 1000 per CPU to two per CPU in uh, idle time. So if you consider that uh, also most of the laptop with uh, Core i7 right now have uh, 8 CPU, you pass from uh, 8K interrupt per second to 16 interrupt per second in idle, which is a big advantage. Also, uh, before you use for the table, in order to find the right bucket, uh, to process or to add events, uh, the mathematical model of function. Right now, this function has been ch changed to, uh, to take uh, a subset of the bits of the new SD type T defined, which are basically a certain amount of bits from the integral part and a certain amount of bits from the fractional part. And this is designed in a way that the, the k changes appro approximately every 4 milliseconds. So every bucket every has 4 milliseconds granularity. You want this choice for uh, some reason. Actually, the wheel bucket should be not too big. Because uh, you don't want to uh, rescan the current bucket uh, more times to find the event. But on the other hand, uh, it shouldn't be too small because if it's too small, you end up with a uh, high number of uh, empty baggage during the processing. Also, the time passed to call out is not anymore relative, but uh, absolute. 
So actually there is a way for, uh, uh, you need a way for um, both to come out internally and um, consumers to know what is the current time. In FreeBSD there are two functions to obtain it. The first is pin up time, which basically goes directly to the hardware timer and uh, it's quite expensive because it requires going directly to the hardware. The second function is uh, uh, relying on a cached variable. So basically, once uh, in a while this variable is refreshed, but you might treat a stale variable. So it's cheaper, but on the other hand, it's less precise. So the changes we have done is take the best of the two words. For small timeouts, for a small amount of uh, time, you use the expensive, but uh, 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 really precise uh, pin up time. After a given threshold, you can use cheap but, re but less precise pin up time. The choice is behind this is that if the threshold is carefully chosen, basically the error you get uh, from uh, uh, get pin up time uh, uh, relatively is uh, less. It's bounded by a given person. So, also recently has been discussed to introduce a given threshold for minimum amount of precision uh, allowed and the maximum amount of precision allowed. Because uh, if at some point one decides to schedule one hour uh, timeout, 5% of one hour is uh, something like 5 minutes. So you do not want to wait so much uh, for, uh, and you bound this to a given threshold. So, in order to uh, coalesce and fear events, also using the new API that's been introduced, allowing uh, specifying the mesh, the, the precision argument, you <coughs> pass this value directly into the struct allowed. For uh, kernel services, you can specify the precision you want. This is not really true for uh, uh, user-led services because you cannot touch them and there is no way at all to uh, um, uh, add an argument to specify precision. So on, we use a system-wide decision where we set a syscontrol uh, tunable that gives us uh, what is the percentage uh, of deviation we allow with respect to the optimal value. And uh, you made an estimation based on the discretion you set, uh, the timeout value passed, uh, and other uh, uh, parameters, for example, HZ, which is the frequency of standard files uh, as expressed before. So when you process the wheel uh, to see if there are some timeouts that has been fired, you uh, basically use both the time uh, uh, absolute at which the function should fire, as well as the precision measures, in order to find if there are events that overlaps. If there are events that overlaps, you schedule an interrupt in the middle, and uh, in this way you uh, have a way to reduce the number of interrupts uh, scheduling uh, a single interrupt for multiple events in the range that overlaps. So, this is the last change that has been done. As I expressed it before, uh, callout cannot directly run from uh, hardware interrupt context, at least uh, not in general. So basically you have a software interrupt the uh, thread that is a, an additional thread. And this uh, need to be scheduled and complete, makes a bit difficult the job of the scheduler. If uh, there is a CPU that is idle and you need to schedule this new thread on another CPU, you need to wake up that CPU. And it may be expensive if the CPU is in a deep state. Also, in any case, uh, you need to uh, the schedule a trend from a CPU in order to schedule switch. And this is a, a context switch additional, which may be an expensive operation, even on recent hardware. 
And also, uh, if you schedule the thread on uh, the other CPU, it's unlikely that the CPU cache of the other CPU have data that you can take benefit of. Uh, the flag argument in the KPI recently introduced try to overcome this issue. Basically, there are some callouts that uh, do not take all the sleeping locks while they are running, or they just call the spin locks and they can run directly from hardware interrupt context. And this uh, eliminates the problem uh, expressed above. No more context switch, no more need to pick up, but uh, on the other hand, it enforces additional constraint in locking. So here's a picture that explains uh, what's uh, the difference between the old and the new behavior. The old behavior is that you have the process, the interrupts arrive, you schedule the software interrupt thread, this CPU becomes idle, and on another CPU, you need to wake up, make a contest switch, and run the process. If you run directly from hardware interrupt complex, this is not true anymore. Because when you schedule the interrupt, when there are interrupts arrive, you can call directly the callback function on the same CPU and the other CPU completely remains idle, avoiding the content. So, this is some experimental results we run on AMD64, 8-core uh, Xeon. So, this line represents the old behavior. Everything uh, is uh, set to 1 millisecond because uh, uh, all the callout, all the timeout were rounded to one millisecond. With the new timeout, basically you have arbitrary precision and you uh, completely overlap and follow the optimal case. Actually, if you schedule the global value for precision as expressed before, these two values at some points uh, uh, are uh, a bit different, but uh, in any case, this is uh, this value is bounded. Also, we run the same test on a uh, Arm Shiva plug, and the results are encouraging. So basically, you schedule uh, one interrupt, uh, you schedule one timeout, uh, and expect it slips uh, for. Uh, 200 milliseconds, 200 microseconds, for example, and it actually switched to for 200 milliseconds, and before it slipped for 1 millisecond. And uh, basically, that's it. Actually, some uh, KPI has been uh, moved to this new mechanism, but uh, this work has not been completed, and uh, lots of KPI can be moved still to this mechanism. There is an ongoing work uh, evaluating uh, where it really takes benefit to, I mean, uh, ex exploit these high precisions for events. And uh, also, in order to completely reduce the interrupt, other projects that uh, really we want to work on uh, is uh, trying to introduce an infrastructure for uh, online and offline on request CPUs, but this basically require a fair amount of work. And also, the KPI introduced that allows to uh, have uh, tried scheduled on uh, every time out scheduled on a given CPU and uh, migrating uh, is not enabled by default. It could be a good project uh, to evaluate uh, what uh, uh, callout can really migrate or can be scheduled in a given CPU in order to gain in terms of affinity. Also, another project that comes to my mind is that I've recently seen that uh, Linux switched to fingerprint timeout in the TCP stack, for uh, and they gain uh, a fair amount in terms of performances and precision, in particular in short lengths, because the, you don't see these advantages uh, in. Uh, 
long distances because uh, the um, latency of the network uh, is the significant factor. But in short lengths, uh, this is not true. And uh, introducing uh, fine timeouts for fine drainage timeouts for CPU for uh, for taking the fine drainage timeouts for TCP might be uh, a good idea. 